Before we get started, a quick thank you to the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Many people familiar with ocean liners and their romantic history know of the betting which occurred among passengers, with participants taking their best guess at the ship's daily run, or miles traveled. Each participant would put money into the pool the night before, and when the daily run was posted by the ship's officers around noon the following day, the person with the closest guess would win the pot. The more zealous players would seek out insider information from crew and officers as to the weather and other factors which might allow them to make a better educated guess and a better chance of winning. It was a competitive and exciting way to keep busy for part of the day during a crossing, a mostly harmless way to pass the time. But this was far from the only form of gambling which occurred aboard ship, and certainly one of the most innocent. While shipping companies generally banned gambling on their ships officially, the rules were almost completely unenforced, and in fact existed primarily as a disclaimer in the event that a passenger had a little too much to drink and inadvertently squandered a small fortune. And besides, the gambling we'll be discussing today was of a more malevolent variety, and would have remained as hidden as possible regardless of the ship's gambling policy. Card sharps have probably been around as long as cards themselves, but some of the more sophisticated of these scammers were found aboard the transatlantic liners of the first half of the 20th century. And that is because a large ocean liner was the perfect size, confined but large enough to blend in, and the transatlantic crossing took the perfect amount of time to carry out a sophisticated hustle before raising the alarm. Not to mention, the express liners of the Atlantic were chock full of wealthy men, many of whom were ripe for swindling. Of course, this necessitated the purchase of an expensive first-class ticket for the crossing, but that was just the cost of doing business, and if all went according to plan, this expense would be a relatively small one. Every shipboard card shark, called boatmen by their land-based counterparts, had their own methods, but the work would always start on the very first day of a crossing by seeking out a suitable target. The soon-to-be victim would usually be chosen by the first evening at sea, and then the real work would begin. The most important element of the scheme was to earn the trust of the target. This is where cunning creativity came into play. One might pose as a cleric, eastbound for work as a missionary, an innocent enough role, perhaps allowing the victim to think they might be in for some easy poker earnings. One card sharp traveled around with a large silver cup inscribed with a variety of well-known names, which served as an easy conversation starter, with the benefit of giving the scammer the ability to come up with a different reason as to why they had earned the cup, depending on the interests of the prospective victim. Other schemes were far more elaborate, involving multiple con men, or even con women, which could serve to make the backstory more convincing, while also making things easier once the actual card playing got underway. This of course necessitated multiple first class tickets, but again, this cost would be well worth it if well played. Before we get into the specifics of the clever schemes of these ocean going card sharps, I want to talk about the sponsor of this video, Skillshare. I first started using Skillshare to learn more about gardening and taking care of houseplants. I recently bought my first home and I wanted to make it feel more like a home by keeping houseplants and starting a small indoor herb garden. But it turns out I don't really have a natural green thumb, so I turned to Skillshare to learn more about growing plants from an expert. Ekta Chaudhary's class on indoor gardening taught me so many things that I didn't even know I didn't know, and I've already implemented much of what I learned to help my plants thrive. Now the succulent on my coffee table is green and healthy, and the herbs in my kitchen are improving my cooking. While I was doing that, I discovered dozens of classes I want to take on Skillshare including classes on personal finance, as well as video editing and animation. So expect to see some improvements to the quality of my videos here on YouTube soon. Is there a skill that you've been wanting to learn? If so, Skillshare is the perfect place to start. It is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring and creative classes for anyone who loves to learn new things. Skillshare is an engaging and easy to use platform, which can help you to make 2022 a year of new learning, growth, and connection through creativity. The first 1,000 of my viewers to sign up by using the code THEGREATBIGMOVE or my link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. Alright, let's get back to the video. One classic scheme, although not the most elaborate, went as follows. A seemingly wealthy and unsuspecting man would, quote, lose his wallet shortly after the ship sailed. Little did he know it was picked from his pocket or otherwise stolen. 
The thief immediately turned the wallet into the purser's office, where the victim would inevitably turn up to inquire about his lost wallet. If all went according to plan, the wallet's owner would ask the purser who turned it in, and shortly thereafter would be knocking on the thief's cabin door to thank him for his good deed. Usually, this cabin would be a large one, preferably a suite with a sitting room. There at the table, two other men, or perhaps a woman for good measure, would be playing a private game of poker, and the third man, the one who opened the door and ostensibly returned the wallet to the purser's office, would enthusiastically invite the unsuspecting man to join the poker game, as a fourth, an offer likely to be accepted by someone thankful for the returned wallet, especially if he was traveling alone, which he likely was, because men traveling alone were the easiest targets to suck in. An hour of poker would turn into two, which would turn into four or five. As the time went on, the newcomer would have found himself up by a considerable amount, perhaps thousands of dollars. This, of course, was by design, as the three accomplices allowed him to repeatedly win, probably throwing in a few wins of their own so as not to raise suspicion that something was off. All the while, it was more than likely that cocktails were flowing. This could have gone on nightly for the duration of the voyage because the single man not only had good company to pass the time with, but was also raking in substantial earnings. When the ship docked, the target disembarked with his pockets lined, but there was still one more game left to be played, because the four men, three accomplices and one lone man, would share a compartment on the boat train to London, or wherever else the final destination might be. This last game, of course, would not go as the others had. The three accomplices, probably with more charisma than the average con artist, had spent the past several days earning the trust and establishing phony but seemingly genuine friendships. Now they would cash in on all that work. As the train was approaching its destination, and with only minutes to spare, the three partners would deal one final game, but this time with a stacked deck. For the last hurrah, they upped the ante dramatically. The victim had won so many games over the past several days, and even right there on the boat train, How could he lose, he thought. But of course he did, and all the earnings he had won were gone, along with a check for thousands more dollars. Within minutes of the train's arrival, the accomplices raced to the bank to claim their money and then disappeared before the victim could really piece things together. I have to say that once the victim finally realized what had happened, the feeling he had must have been awful. The hustlers took his money and made him feel like an utter fool at the same time. It was adding insult to injury. On top of that, what would have been a good story to tell his friends and family about a lucky streak of poker he had had on his travels turned into something too embarrassing to ever reveal. Much of the time, this embarrassment was enough to keep the victim quiet, not that there was much that could have been done by that time. If you ask me, many of these boatmen, as they were called, must have been sociopaths. The skill and patience it took to engage in convincing and meaningful conversation and friendship building over the course of many days but still have the ability to detach enough to go through with the devastating scam against their victim is incredible, at least to me. Some of these con men went even further, though. In some instances, the same scenario as we just went through would end with the scammer faking sympathy for the victim, who does not realize he was the victim of an elaborate scam, apparently, and offered to accept any cash the victim had on him at the time instead of the check for the full amount. Once the scammer took whatever cash was offered, he took a piece of paper from his pocket presumably the check the victim had written, tore it up and threw it out the train window or, if they were still on the ship, overboard. Of course, the real check was still in his pocket and this piece of paper was blank or otherwise meant to resemble a check. The unsuspecting victim wouldn't bother to cancel a torn up check and would later discover that he was out of his cash and the money in the bank. But these swindlers were not always successful, especially if they got overconfident. Signs were posted in the smoking rooms of ships warning passengers of the dangers of playing cards or otherwise gambling with strangers. This was where setup games were played to lure in prospective suckers. On some ships, once movies became standard on board entertainment, slides were put up briefly warning passengers of lurking card sharks in between movies. Not only that, but the crew of the large express liners in particular were cognizant of the presence of these infamous boatmen who frequented their ships. This was one of the reasons why the real games and scams rarely took place in smoking rooms and the scammers only used these public spaces for setting up their schemes. The boatmen almost always traveled under false names, usually a different name on each voyage, and some even carried forged documents to this effect. Although this was avoided because, unlike most of their illicit activity, forgery was clearly a crime. In one instance, one of the stewards aboard a large liner went to serve a familiar face, but the steward didn't know his name, as he always traveled under a different name. 
the steward loudly projected for all to hear, What name this time, sir? The steward's question served to at least embarrass the passenger and maybe cost him a week's worth of income. When the swindlers were unwise enough to finish off their plan while the ship was still at sea, they had better have hoped that the victim would be too embarrassed to complain to the crew. In one instance, documented by Captain Arthur Rostron of Titanic fame, is an example of why card sharps did whatever they could to fly under the radar. While Captain Rostron was in command of Cunard's RMS Mauritania, the purser went to him about a passenger who had complained that he had been swindled out of some $13,000, a huge sum of money. Rostron met with the passenger, who had been playing bridge. When the passenger was telling the story of what happened, Rostron cut in and asked if he had held the ace, king, queen, jack, nine, and one other card, to which the astonished passenger replied in the affirmative. Rostron knew what was going on because he had seen such a scenario from a card chart before, and he had taken the time to write down that hand of cards. He ordered the purser to fetch the three gamblers in question, after some denial, eventually could not hide their plot any longer under Rostron's pressure but they still refused to give back the money. Under the threat of arrest, the con men agreed to give back half of the money, some $6,500, but Rostron was still not satisfied. Eventually, he got them to give back all but $2,000, apparently an acceptable loss in Rostron's mind for someone who had been foolish enough to play cards with strangers aboard a ship. According to Rostron, he came across that hand he had written down a few more times throughout his career, and he always made the card sharps give back the earnings except for $2,000. Rostron was not the only captain to get involved in similar disputes, although he was probably the most well-known to do so. There were countless ways for sophisticated con artists to scam fellow passengers out of their money aboard ocean liners, some of which are frankly impressive. I do feel badly for some of the more naive passengers who got swindled and embarrassed, but you have to admit that all of this has a sort of romantic allure to it, in much the same way that a murder mystery on a transcontinental passenger train does, and I can't help but root for the bad guys just a little bit when I look back on it a century later. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next one. Starting with this video, my new schedule is to upload a video on the first of every month. Thank you for watching.